So we made it all the way to 100. The big centennial, is that the right word, centennial? No work. Episode. Yep. Uh, so 100 episodes, and um, if you're just now joining us for the first time, this is our weekly Row by Row Garden Show. We do this every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. We do it on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Hulse Gardening Tools. We also do it on our Facebook channel at YouTube, or excuse me, facebook.com slash Hulse Tools. So you can, you can watch it uh, either place you want to. You can watch it right at 8 like a lot of our viewers do, or you can catch it. Uh, later that night or the next morning. That's the great thing about the internet. It is. And also on Facebook, we have a group called Row by Row, which is a great group to be a part of. To, uh, if you love and passionate about gardening as we are, you can be a part of that. Post your pictures, ask your questions, be a part of a community that's interested in growing their own food. Right. And during this time when, when we had to kind of close our phone lines just so we could start to get orders out and keep getting orders out, you know, if you do have gardening questions and stuff like that, that group on Facebook is a great place to go because there's a, there are lots of people on there more knowledgeable than we are. Uh, yeah, but not only that, there's people there from different regions, and we know right. garden varies from region to region. So it's always interesting to me to see people from up north or way down south. We've got a lot of people down in Florida, south Florida, that's uh, on our Robo Row group. And it's interesting to see challenges and, and the things they do that they're successful at it that maybe we could bar some or we could maybe learn from. Yeah, and I never realized how South Louisiana is a good bit south of us, and man, they, they got, they're two to three weeks ahead of us yep. on most things. I uh, so. Texas, and then those, our great friends up north, you know. Right. Yeah. We always love to get the head start on them, show off our tomatoes and everything, but then people in South Louisiana and South Florida kick our tail on the squash. They've been eating squash and cucumbers for a while now. Yeah. I always tell them people up north don't get too jealous because in a few months we can't grow nothing. Yeah. And uh, they'll, they'll still have some really nice looking gardens. Uh, so we made it to 100 shows. Uh, we appreciate all you guys who've been watching since this thing started or have been watching while all our loyal viewers out there. Uh, it's really been fun. It's been a pleasure to do this, um, and, and we just have fun with it every week. Uh, we don't try to take this too seriously. And we hope you don't either. That's right. That's right. And we're just here to talk about growing our own food and, and trying to help you grow your own food better. Um, we had a little bit of rain shower last night. It was supposed to, there was a bad storm come through. We On a row by row group we were talking about, uh, we can always kind of, know when the storm's coming because our friends in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, they'll they'll talk about how they're getting hammered. Yeah. And a lot of times it'll peter out before it gets over here a little bit. And uh, it didn't do a whole lot early um, last night, but then I woke up this morning and I had two inches or so. So it, it, sometime when I was resting my eyes, it come down. Well, it actually woke me up. We got about an inch and a quarter here, but it, uh, it come down pretty good for a little while. I had about two inches. Thankfully, no bad wind, no bad tornadoes or anything like that. So we didn't have no bad weather. We just got a good rain. Yeah, my, my corn is uh, is looking real, real good. I got a pretty crop of sweet corn I believe I've ever had. Now my field corn's struggling a little bit and I got to do some doctor on it uh, shortly. Uh -huh. But my, I mean, I got a beautiful crop of sweet corn. And I was gonna mention this, you know, I planted the sweet corn with our garden cedar and you're not gonna get it perfect. But this is what works for me. I always love to plant it a little thick. Me too. So I planted it a little thick and then I went back out there and I thinned it out a little bit. Man, I got a perfect stand just like I wanted. I wanted them about four inches apart, three to four inches apart. And I mean, I got a pretty crop. I got the fertilizer to them just right. I laid them by. Everything is looking good on my uh, on my corn. Yeah, mine's greening up too. And then, you know, I, it's been a good year for corn, but I have to give a lot of credit to that Avalon, man. I've been hearing from customers. There was a guy on the Road by Road group uh, the other day said he's been growing Silver Queen and Silver King for years. Yep. And uh, he said he planted some of the Avalon, and he said he ain't never seen a corn get up and grow like that one does. He said if it tastes yeah. as good as it grows, Ooh, we in trouble. he ain't planting no more Silver King. We in trouble. Now, my field corn <coughs> has got some issues, and it's got some yellow leaves down at the bottom of the base of the plant. My field corn's about two weeks older than my sweet corn is. That's a telltale sign to me that I missed a little bit on the fertility on that. Missed the window because you got to get it to it early. If you got some yellow on them leaves, you've missed a little something there. Of course, I got high dry land. I don't worry about drowning out. 
But I got to go over there and I got to shoot something to it quick, pump it back up. Uh -huh. Because I know I got some little bit of problems there. My sweet corn's looking good. I just laid it by. Speaking of that, I had an aha moment. Uh -oh. You know uh -huh. what an aha moment is? Yeah. So I was out there with my hark and I was laying my sweet corn by. And I done got me about four good rows of it. And I looked up and I said to myself, whew, wish I had a chair up here. Uh -huh. Then I realized just in a few days, I'm going to be 55 years old. Yeah. And I have never in my life had a chair or a bucket or anything to sit on in my garden. Never really crossed my mind. Uh -huh. I didn't go up there to sit. I went up there to work. I've never sat down up there. Uh -huh. But that aha moment said to me, you know how them old men get out of their garden and they work a little bit, sit down a little bit? Yeah. I think I'm getting to that point. I may have to put me a chair up there. Yeah. Now I have, I don't have a chair out there at mine, but I, I got my little my little uh, side by side. I use to haul stuff around my property and stuff. And every now and then, I have to take me a break, have me a cold refreshment, sit on that side by side, and then I get back after. But I don't have me a designated sitting spot. No, sir. What we do is we get we get we have to go drink of water. I walk over to the water hose. Uh -huh. I turn it on. I drink. I love to drink out of water hose. And I drink out of water hose and tank my dog. Normally got to have him a <laughs> belly full. So me and him will get us a belly full of water and we go right back to work. But it's just amazing to me that I've never thought about sitting down to just the other day. Yeah, I'm more of a pacer. I pace around, walk around. I, I don't know. Uh, even at home, I, if I sit down in the in the afternoons and I come home, my wife gets on to me. But if I sit down in my chair, I'll fall asleep. So I, I keep going, just keep moving so I don't get tired. Yeah. But any of you people out there that's in your later, later in life like I'm beginning to be, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I'm talking about that chair. I can remember the old people garden that worked, especially my daddy. My daddy's 82 years old and he does it to this day, but he'll work a little bit and he'll sit down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm understanding that philosophy a little bit better every day. Now, once, once these bush beans come in, I will get me a bucket and scoot along that road and sit on that bucket and just move my bucket down and pick them bush beans. No, sir, uh, I'll lean over and get her done. When I, <laughs> into what I'm doing, I, I'm full force. Um, so we got corn doing good. Let's talk about maters real quick, because I got a video coming out next week, I think Tuesday, uh, showing the Florida weed. We've done, I do a video on that every year, just because, every, you know, it's something neat. It really works. Everybody likes to see it done. And boy, I got some of the prettiest looking tomatoes. Ooh, I do it. too. Common thing, and I've mentioned this before, I mentioned again. Common thing people have trouble with growing tomatoes is they malnourish them. Uh -huh. They underfeed them. You got tomatoes love that fertilizer. You got to have that green, green, dark green leaf to it. I believe, I walked out there earlier today, I believe mine grew six inches overnight. Yeah. I've been, uh, I've been steady every two weeks i've been alternating 20 20 20 micro boost and then i'll do calcium nitrate and then i'll go back i've been going back and forth that's been kind of a plan this year it's working pretty well i've got my first line of string ran on my yes, leaves i do too uh and some of the varieties get close to being the second one my leaders in the clubhouse right now and i talk about this in my video on tuesday you can see it uh, brickyard summer pick and the red snapper are my three best looking plants right now now we don't we won't know you know they're starting to put on blooms all of the varieties are starting to put on blooms we won't know about productivity and taste until uh, we get there we know the brickyard tastes pretty good last year but we don't know about the summer pick and the red snapper yet but i've heard some good things from customers so far about the red snapper jason at cog hill said his red snappers were looking fine so um, what do you do when you see those blooms on your tomato plants you, you got to make sure you got some calcium to them. You lay that gypsum to them at that point. Or that calcium nitrate. Or calcium nitrate or both. You can mm -hmm. very, I, I, I'm doing both this year. So I'm fertilizing, alternating just like you are with that 20, 20, 20 in my uh, calcium nitrate. But it bloom set, boom, I'm hitting them some gypsum. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, and what I do is I take me a good handful, just throw down there at roots of it. You ain't got to worry about burning it and uh, roll along. Now, one thing that I will tell you, I've noticed this over a period of years. If you go down that road, especially if you've got them strung, you want to throw and you throw it one side of them. What will happen a lot of times, that calcium will just take up on one side of that plant. So you got to make sure that you hit the entire root system there or it'll just take up on that. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Let's, uh, let's talk about squ squash real quick. Oh, squash is coming in, ain't squash it? Squash is coming in and I've been picking squash. Now, 
You ain't got to pick squash every day, but with my little market farming operation, I try. To, I, I pick try. Mine, I pick mine every day. I try to keep to, to go for a specific size. Um, if I'm just picking them for myself, I'll pick them a little smaller. But for market farm operation, I got kind of an ideal size. And I got two home run, I'm talking about home run varieties I want to show y'all. So, let me open these up. So this right here is a gold star crook neck. Now some of these ain't as crooked as some of the others are. But that's, that's your crook neck there. Okay. And then here. And this one right here is a smooth skin compared to that old, old variety that's really got the bumps all over it. Right. It's easier to clean. I find it's easier to clean and prepare for cooking. And this is a gold prize straightening. Now this is about the size I like to pick them right there. You can let them get bigger than this, but this is about what, what I like to go to. We grew this one last year and myself along with some a bunch of our customers had said that it was the quote making the squash they had ever seen. But I do believe so far preliminarily uh Preliminary results mm. are telling, showing that this booger right here will even outproduce this guy. Wow. Now, so you know, some people, I've had people ask me, does this, this a taste a, a lot different? I can't tell a huge difference in the taste. A lot of people will swear by the crook neck. We had an old fella come in here, it was a month or so ago, and he said, if that squash ain't got a crook in it, it ain't no good. Um, so, some people just love that crook neck. You can get, we sell the uh, early crook neck with the bumps on it. This is a nice smooth one, good disease resistant. This is called Gold Star. Gold Star, we got a lot of golds in our squash. And if you, if with squash, especially if you live in the south, you don't need to just plant one around the squash. So just in a few more weeks, when your squash get making real, real good, now you, you, this ain't gonna make a whole lot of sense in your mind, but when your plants, when they start sure enough putting it out, that's when you need to get you another row set up somewhere else and go and get you another row or two planted. That way you can have another plant and you can get two or three of those plantings in. At least. So, so got to be prepared. You, you, you won't think, man, my, I got to plant some more squash because all these are making. Uh, but if you want to have squash all the way, you know, up until midsummer, so. And you know, the thing about squash plant. is there's a lot of different colors, there's different varieties, there's different textures, there's different shapes of squash. Uh -huh. So mix it up a little bit. I mean, maybe plant you some crook necks and plant you some straight necks next time. Switch them and grow you some patty pans. My first round this year were patty pans. Yeah, so right now I've got sunburst, I got these gold prize straight necks. I got the gold star crook necks. I've got some spineless beauty zucchinis. On my next go round of planting, um, I probably would just go with, I don't know, they're good ones. Uh, and they give me a lot of productivity. I might go both of them. I'm definitely going to go with one of them. And what about zucchinis? Uh, zucchinis, I'm going to go with that Pascola, the second go round. And then I've got some, uh, speaking of squash, I'm gonna try some of these. I got the sunburst planted now. I think I mentioned these last week we were talking about patty pants. I brought them this week. We got that sunburst, but we also got three other kind of patty pants here. We just recently added. So you can get all different kind of color schemes with your patty pants. We got the moonbeam, which is the white. This total eclipse, which is a dark green one. And then this partial eclipse here. Well, now that one's really confusing to me because it looks like some of the winter squash we got. Yeah, and uh, then we've got the Benny's green tint and we've got the uh, the summer. So we got five different colors of patty pans out there. Yeah, and that green uh, Benning's green tint, if you were to Google patty pan squash, it comes up a lot because it's an old variety. And when we talk about patty pan squash, that's what most people think of. But they are different, several different colors of them, and I love them patty pans. Now, I don't think a patty pan is a frying squash. Patty pan to me is a stewing squash. Uh, it, it, I like it. Uh, I like to cook them on my flat top. I like to grill them and saute them. But. Yeah, that's fine, but, I, but we like to eat a lot of fried ones. But when yeah. I do that, I either want me a straight neck or me a zucchini. Yeah. Just works better Yeah, I, the, uh, that gold prize there, that's a fine frying squash because with the crook necks, the only thing is, you know, you get down to this end here, you get them little pieces, you don't get quite as much out of it. 
if you're going to just slice them up for frying and want some uniformity in your pieces, that's a fine one to go with right there. Last thing. Beans. Beans. We got, I've been, man, just, I, I got flowers all over mine. We was waiting on them to, to start making. Uh, I, mean, I got tiny ones on there. They ain't quite big enough. Yeah, beans are one of them things you want to plant early in your garden in the springtime. They don't do good in the summertime. We talk about planting these squash over and over again. You can have squash coming in on into July. You can. You want to get your beans in early and make that bean crop and then move on to something else because bees just do not like that hot, hot weather. So, and they, and they make fairly quick. Yeah. But they'll throw them blooms off in hot, hot weather. So you want to get your beans in. When your beans is coming in, your potatoes are coming in, and your squash is coming in, whoo, you're talking about some good eating. That's good stuff right there. Speaking of potatoes, <coughs> I, thought, I thought I better talk about this just a little bit. Mm -mm -mm. All right, so what I did, my potatoes ain't quite ready, but they were getting real close. You're I know scratching. our folks down in Florida is uh, eating them a lot better than we are. But we went out there and scratched uh, some potatoes. Now, scratch is the art of getting you a few potatoes out before it's really time. What happens is when that vine gets big and it's nice and green, then they started dying back yet, and your potatoes flowers on them. Flowers on, but your your potatoes not fully developed. But you've got you a hankering for you some potatoes. You can go out there and the, after they dry out a little bit, you don't want to go out there right after a rain or two. But when your dirt starts to dry a little bit, you'll see little cracks in the top of where your potato bed is, where your vines come out at. And in those cracks is what is happening. That potato is pushing that dirt away. So what no, you want to do... You, when your onions start bulbing. Yeah, about the same time. You want to take your hand like this right here and just go down in that crack real easy. Then you start scratching. And then you feel a little something. And you just ease in there and pull it out. And you don't damage everything else because you're stealing is what you are. You're stealing <laughs> off that vine. And that's what we did is we stole us a few off the vine to get us going. Now, what we stole was some red norlins. You see this red norlin here. Now, that by no means is the big potatoes I'm going to grow. That's an early scratching potato before you get carried away there. Right. <laughs> Here's my Yukon Golds right here. Same thing. They're not real big, but that's a scratching potato. And then we have these pretty babies right here, which is the Australian Cressets. Now, the Australian Cressets to me... I think it's Austrian Cressets. Austrian, excuse me. Australian. That's a different place, ain't it? Yeah. A whole other country. A whole other country. That is the ideal... That and the French finger is the ideal roasting potatoes. And the way I prepared these right here was... I washed them real good, and you'll notice when you first dig them, they're a lot easier to wash. Take me a sponge, just wash them off. I dry them, pat them dry. Then I put them in a pan, and I put me some olive oil on them, and I just throw them around in that pan, let the olive oil get on them. I oil my cooking pan here just a little bit. Then I put me some of that natural sea salt on uh -huh. them. Then I put them in that oven for about 350 degrees, and I roast them. Now, it can take up to about 30 minutes. And you want to have you some of this Ireland butter or either some of that Amish butter right there. Mm. Kind of put them in that right there. And That's partake. good stuff right there. You can't beat that. Mm. Now, we had never grown this Austrian crescent, but we had been told by a lot of people that that was a very highly sought after tater. Very considered extremely gourmet. You, you, if you're going to eat some of them not at the house, you got to go to a pretty high-end restaurant and get home. Well, now, that there. potato right there is not a frying potato. It's not a mashing potato. That is a roasting potato. But it's fit for that, ain't it? It is. Now, I'm going to try one of these red northerns here. Now, the red northern is kind of a dual-purpose potato. You can do about anything you want to do with it. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's good. That sea salt on there. Red northern's got that white flesh inside there. It's a telltale sign on it. And here we have... The old staple, probably my favorite variety. Excuse me, I'm trying to talk my mouth full. That old Yukon. Yeah, the Yukon Gold is a good one. As we say, it's got the butter built already in. Nice yellowish flesh in there. That is probably my, if I could only grow one potato, that'd be it right there. Yeah, as far as size, production, all that stuff. And, and I, even though I ain't got a whole lot of tater plants, it has been a good spring for taters because it, it, we got a little worried in March because it struck off hot for about a week there. We have nice, cool weather. You couldn't have asked for a better tater year. I was talking to uh, Danny and Wanda at Deep South, and, and um, they said, man, the, the weather this year, with the exception of a few storms that's come through and tore some stuff up, 
it, it, everything they got said it's just kind of gangbusters. Uh, the only thing that mine's maybe struggled a little bit is my okra. Maybe struggled a little bit with these cool nights. You know, mine's growing. My transplants, they took hold. They're growing. Um, I got new growth on them. But um, if you're not growing potatoes, definitely next year, make preparations to grow you some potatoes. It's one of those crops that comes off early in the season when your onions start coming off and you can start eating out of that garden pretty early. Man, squash, onions, potatoes. And now uh, we didn't get to, we didn't get to grow all eight of the varieties that we carry or carried this year. And uh, that's just because we sold out of some of them before we even allocated some for ourselves. But if you want to see them growing, See what the plants look like, just a, a, just full bloom. Go over there to the Deep South Homestead Channel. They grew every all eight varieties we grew. They've been posting pictures on their Facebook, Instagram. So follow them on social media and on YouTube. You can see, man, they got some awesome looking taters they've been growing. Now, Miss Wanda posted a picture of some blue ones they were cooking the other day. They look fine. Potatoes are one of those things that are a good fresh potato that you pull out of the garden, you go wash and you roast it like we did right here, has got a, a improved flavor and taste and texture to it than the store-bought potatoes that's been in storage for a while. I hear people say all the time, man, I can't grow potatoes. I go buy a bag of potatoes for nearly nothing. And that's true. Potatoes are cheap in the store. But those potatoes have been stored in uh, cold storage or storage facility for a few months and have been out there and those skins got tough on them. There's a lot of difference in the flavor and what we've got right here. Now, some people, I know some people will peel potatoes, but I ain't never been one to peel a tater. I, I will, lay, if I'm dealing with them old taters that you buy at the store, that old tip peeling's rough on, I will those, but I ain't gonna peel mine. I don't really peel anything. I don't peel maters, I don't peel cucumbers. I just, I eat the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I won't eat a pumpkin rind or watermelon no, rind. No. All right, a few more things to talk about here. I showed you those new patty pan varieties. Man, those are fit right there. They are fit to eat. Um, and a few more new varieties we got. One of these I'm really excited about. So this is a, a variety of sweet corn. Now, we've been talking about them triple sweet corn. We got the Avalon growing. And I, where I got, a, I got a plot right beside mine. So my Avalon's about this tall, 18, 24 inches tall. I got a plot in a dream garden right beside there. I still got some collards growing. Uh, and I got some beets I got to get out of there this weekend. Once I get them beets out of there, I'm gonna turn that plot over and I'm gonna plant me another crop of sweet corn. Wow. I'm gonna come in there and stagger. But I've heard of a lot of people that they say they just plant it every three or four weeks. Like you do squash. Like I do squash. So that's what I'm gonna do. Now, I was gonna plant me another triple sweet until you ever have something just come through on for you? What you're lay. talking about there, what you're speaking of is an aha moment. Well, it wasn't an aha moment. Some, something I've been working on and waiting on, and it finally just come through for me. So this is a corn variety that I tried to get last year, and I wasn't able to get it. But I had packets for it printed, had it ready to go. I just wasn't able to get it. Mm. And I finally able to get my hands on some of it. Um, what it might it be? This is called Temptress Sweet Corn. Now, we talked about the triple sweets. Yes, we this did. This is a quad sweet. Quad. This is a quad sweet with exceptional disease resistance, 70 days to maturity. So this is going to be mm. some fast, fast growing corn. So we got this in the packets. We got this in the pounds. This is what old Trav's going to plant. This is a bicolor. Supposed to be some fine, fine eating stuff for the wow. uh, what they call a fresh market corn. So it's not a processing corn, fresh market corn. You know, if you was growing for a roadside stand and you want to make people's uh, tongue just slap them all over the face, this would be the one to grow here. So mm. um, it's got a 94% germination rate on it. So fine, fine germ. All those triple sweets, these quad sweets have really, really good germination. Yeah, I've noticed that. So, uh, if you haven't made up your mind on your corn, or maybe you want to plant your second round of sweet corn, we've got this Temptress Quad Sweet here, and uh, I am looking forward to growing some of that stuff. One more variety we just added, uh, and I got a video coming this Saturday showing my South Anna Butternut Squash I got growing, I transplanted, looking real good. We got a new variety of winter squash we just added, this one here called excuse me Amish pie so this is a bigger winter squash almost looks like a 
there's a variety of pumpkin out there called porcelain doll. Yes. Kind of looks like that a little bit, but this thing is just going to be full of meat, big old, nice, meaty winter squash. Almost looks like a pumpkin there. Um, great storage crop. Man, you can eat on these a while. And you don't have to grow a huge plot of these to have a lot. You can take that pumpkin meat, freeze it. They store well. You can go out there and uh, split one with your neighbor, cut it in half. Um, really, really good crops. Uh, as I said in my video, this is coming on Saturday. You know, winter squash to me, something you, you got to have in your garden. Yep, I agree. Because you'll be harvesting here. those come July, and when some of the other stuff can't take the heat, then you're going to have some nice food supplies there at late summer. I went years and years without gardening, I mean, with gardening without growing winter squash. I was just introduced to them, oh, maybe six or seven years ago. And I thought to myself, man, I've been missing out on a lot. But ever since I started growing them, I made sure I plant some every year. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. So we got a couple of friends of ours that have started some new YouTube channels, or newer YouTube channels, let me put it that way. And we want to encourage you, if you're out there, you know, these are some long days and weeks now, if you're, especially if you're quarantined at home or, or you're following the stay-at-home orders, and you're on YouTube a lot and you're bouncing around. Of course, we got several friends out there, Deep South, uh, Jason at Cog Hill, but we got a couple of new guys you may want to go check out. That's right. So our YouTube channel just hit 75,000 subscribers. It's been growing. It's, it's just took off lately. It's been growing at an overwhelming rate. We've been getting about a thousand new subscribers a day, which is just great. And, uh, and, and it's, I, I will admit, it's tough when you're doing a YouTube channel for a business as compared to doing like what some of the others Deep South and Jason do because uh, there are some people out there that are a little more skeptical of our videos because we're, you know, talking about some of our products, which is understandable. So our growth curve is a little more flattened um, than some of the other YouTubers out there. And we may not be as entertaining as some of the YouTubers. Well, I can't Jason. dance as good as Jason, Jason can. Jason can cut it up, son. <laughs> so anyway, but well, we're really happy to have some momentum lately. We hit 75,000. Looks like we'll hit 100,000 this year, which was our goal. And, and this YouTube thing, man, the first few years you do it, it takes a lot of dedication because you're just plugging away, you're just putting out videos and you're not getting a whole lot of traction. It takes a while to kind of get some traction. Now there are exceptions to that, some channels just blow up, but it takes a while. And, and that first 10,000 subscribers, man, is the hardest to get. I mean, you're just plugging away, plugging away, just hoping to get 500, 1,000 views on a video. It's tough. Once you get to 10,000, you can kind of start ramping up a little bit from there but there are two new channels out there uh and i've watched these really good content these guys are funny they do a great job with it and, and i want us to help them kind of get that push they need to get some momentum going so they can grow and the first one is called uh the channel is called the naked hog Ooh, how'd he come up with that you reckon i don't know I don't know if he butchers hogs or, or whatever. I'm not sure how he come up with it. Maybe he can uh, comment. I know he watches the show sometimes. So maybe he can comment and tell us how he got the name. So The Naked Hog. Uh, check that one out. Make sure you subscribe to his channel. And then the other one is called Adler Farms. A-D-L-E-R-F-A-R-M-S. Adler's Farms. So uh, they just started. You know, just got... Uh, a few hundred subscribers, I think, at this point. But if you guys go out there, check out their channels, subscribe to their channels. Let's help them give a little, get, give them a little push, give them a little motivation, keep making good videos, and uh, everybody will benefit. But from you that. know, one thing I've noticed is we got our own scaled way of doing things. We all, we, we grow about pretty good sized gardens, right? And we got a certain way of doing things. When I watch these guys, some of Adler Farms and. You know, they got maybe on a smaller scale and they may do things a little bit different. And it gives people in, you know, inspires them if they do have a smaller place to garden on or if they do things a little bit different, may inspire them or give them ideas to do it maybe a little different. I mean, just because we do it a certain way don't mean it's the only way. That's right. That's right. I will agree. So good channels out there to check out. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention. So what we always like to... Uh, kind of poke fun at some of the old wife tales and myths out there uh, when it comes to gardening and, and Lord knows there are a ton of them 
and uh, there, with people that really believe in these old wives tales and stuff, there seems to be a lot of what we call confirmation bias, where they, you know, they swear up and down it works, and when the times when it don't work, they don't really talk about it. Um, so me and Jason at Cog Hill was talking, and he he sent me a screenshot. He had somebody telling him, and I've heard this before, and I don't it doesn't make any sense. Somebody telling him that he need to put a 16 penny nail in the ground beside his tomato plant, and that'll keep the grubs from getting off of it. Now it can't be any other kind of nail. It's got to be a 16 penny nail. I've never I've never heard that before. I feel like I've heard that before. Not scientifically, I can't. Uh, I can't understand the reason behind that. But uh, now we know if you look in a lot of your fertilizers and stuff, they'll have uh, iron oxide as a micro or minor nutrient in some of your fertilizers. Because uh -huh. a lot of your turf grasses respond well to iron. Uh -huh. Iron oxide simply rusts. Right. So I can see, it, although it takes years for it to break down, it's kind of a hoax in fertilizer. I could see trying to get some iron to a plant through a 16 penny nail, although it would be a lot longer process than the lifespan of a tomato plant. Mm -hmm. but I could see that, but I just can't understand how it's going to work on grubs. Yeah, I don't see it either. Uh, you know, have you ever had a grub put, problem? Like Jason said, now he could see if you if you took a bunch of them and made you a little <laughs> fence around the plant there, they couldn't get in there, you could lock them out. We really, in our area here, we, as far as vegetable garden, we don't have much of a grub problem. No, I don't have much of a worm problem on anything. Um, what, worms are pretty easy to, to kill. Uh, uh, any form of larval insect is pretty easy to manage. It's some adults that are just rapidly reproducing, you know, those mm -hmm. mature squash bugs. Those are the ones that are just almost impossible. Right. But, uh, larva and worms are pretty easily managed. They're a lot easier to control with what we call cultural methods than some of your flying insects are because your flying insects are mobile. Can't do a whole lot there. But if you practice good sanitation and some good practices in your garden, such as keeping cover crops there, keeping it work, keeping managing your soil, you can manage those worms and those larvas and things like that with those type methods and it helps a lot. Yeah, back to the squash real quick. Now, we have a lot of people asking about squash vine borers. What do you do about them? How do you keep them getting them? And, and I don't really understand this, but I don't know that I've ever seen a squash vine borer in my garden. Now, I get squash bugs, but uh, we don't have an issue with squash vine borers. And I'm not really sure why. I'm not sure if it's just our region. The, the other people that live close to us here have issues with them. Maybe it's our rotation. I don't have an issue with them. I don't know that I've ever had. I know what they look like. I've seen them before, but I don't I don't ever remember having an issue. So I do. it has not necessarily been intentional that I don't have an issue with them, but there couldn't be some of our practices that are more conducive to, to not having an issue. And we have squash bugs like crazy in August, September. We don't try to grow them. Oh, I've actually had a little outbreak of squash bugs already. Yeah, but we don't, I've never had vine borers. Never mm, had issues never with have those, been. and I'm not really sure why. Okay, so we didn't have a main topic for today's uh, 100th episode, but we just kind of wanted to, to talk about some of our favorite episodes out there. And those of you who watch a lot of the shows, definitely put in the comments below <coughs> what's been some of your favorite moments, um, you know, if you've been watching a while through these 100 shows we've done. Uh, first, I want to talk about how this all got started. So we were at a um, conference in... <coughs> I have to get me some water. Uh-oh. We, we, we were at a conference, a marketing conference in Orlando. Orlando, Florida, at a Disney resort. Yeah, at a Disney resort. And um, there was some other industry colleagues and experts in the gardening kind of sector and niche. And uh, there was a guy presenting, and he was talking about doing a weekly Facebook live feed. And we were already at that point doing several gardening videos a week, but we weren't doing anything like this and he was saying you know this is a good way to connect with the audience sure. kind of let loose a little bit and so we first started off we were going to do this thing live every week well <clears throat> we live out in the boonies and even though we do have a <coughs> excuse me yeah right? yeah we do have a fiber internet connection sometimes the technology of live streaming can be tricky Yep. So, so we tried that to start with. We did, and we had bumps and bruises. And man, we had all kinds of cut in and cut out. ins, cut outs. So we ended up doing this pre-recorded thing. Now, don't get all upset because we don't pre-record this months in advance. We do it a day, sometimes, sometimes same, day. same day. 
as we do, and we like to show it, premiere it at 8 o'clock at night because we think that's an ideal time <coughs> when you come in from the garden and you're ready to sit down and relax a little bit. The last thing we want to do is interrupt your working time. So that's the reason we don't show it to you at 6 o'clock afternoon because your rear end needs to be out there holding that garden. So <laughs> we like, we, yeah, we like when you come in about 8 o'clock, you can sit down. And if you know what, if you're a little late or they're coming in at 8 o'clock or if you got something going on that night, you can watch it later. That's right. So we we, tran we we quit doing the live thing. The technology just wouldn't cooperate with us, or maybe I didn't have enough sense how to do it. Uh, so we decided to pre-record it a day or two in advance. So that it's current. You know, we're talking about things that are happening in our gardens right now. And then... Uh, Today is Thursday, matter of fact. Right. And so then we publish it on Thursday nights. And uh, it, it's been going... It was just like with anything... When you first started out, it's slow to go, slow to get some audience and momentum. But uh, I'm very happy with how many people we have that watch the show on a regular basis. Very thankful for those. Oh, absolutely. Years. Humbled by it. Uh, I did want to talk about some of my most memorable moments. And I'm sure there are more than this, but uh, a, a few that kind of stick out and I always hear people talk about. The, the first one was uh, last year when you were harvesting that Honey Select sweet corn. And um, you was talking about how terrible it was. And you ended up eating a whole bowl of it. Well, I got sure. started, got carried away. But here's the deal with us. I watch some of these YouTube channels where they're doing gun or ammunition or whatever reviews. And reviews always seem to be like, you can know the way they're going to turn out when you start watching. You know they're going to always bring it. We kind of like to tell it just like it is. So if we don't like something, we say we don't like it. Or vice versa. If I like something, I'm going to tell you. I'm like, no, nah, I did not like that honey slick corn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I ate it, but I didn't like it. <laughs> well, well, it, you, you could have fooled us because yeah. it sure looked like you liked it. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. We had uh, last year, and we'll probably do this again this year because we got some new varieties we need to uh, to add to the mix. But we did our tomato taste testing last year, and that was pretty good. It did. You know, one thing that really blew me away with that uh -huh. is there was not really a lot of difference. No, but... but there was there's a, a <coughs> more difference between the heirlooms than there was the hybrids. They were. They the, were. the hybrids were pretty close. They were. They. I but, was expecting more difference in tasting than some of them, but maybe our and I, the ones that came out on top. I remember were sun gold and yellow pear. Sun gold, uh, as far as yeah, those that was the uh, the sun gold. Just man, it's just got it just pops. Yeah. Really like it. And the. Uh, I shouldn't have. I still feel bad about it. I played play a mean little trick when we were. Yeah, doing it was that. terrible. I kind of had an inkling something was fixing to happen bad, but that, when I got when I get blindfolded, I always get a little upset, nervous, and. Anyway. And you, you did the right. You didn't pay me back when you could have. No, I didn't. I don't operate like that. That's right. What else? Uh, this was not too long ago. We was in the middle of filming the show, and we just all of a sudden lost power. We did. And uh, and it happens, and we had to come back the next day and film the show. Yep. Um, they're all the time working on these roads around here. Somebody cut a line or... Well, you know, come find out what happened was they was putting a large whale across the road to irrigate out of Oh, uh, really? Yep, and they they had some issues and got into the, a war. <laughs> they didn't um, yep. They didn't call the call before you no, dig. No, they didn't call before the dig. Uh, what else? We had... Uh, the, this fall slash winter, we had a big debate on growing big cabbage. We did. And we showed the diversity of growing big cabbage or, or good eating cabbage. Right. And we had some sauerkraut mishaps. You know, I ate some of yours last night. That was still good. Yeah, it keeps in the fridge for a while. I've got where I eat it um, every now and then, not on a hot dog oh, or nothing. I, I just eat me a yeah. little side of it with my yeah. meal. I kind of like that little funky taste that's got to it. Yeah. I should have brought some, but I used I used um, well, I used a regular jar top on the ones I put in the fridge for store. But the the one I'm working out of, I use those little working out. Of yeah, it. I use those little multi top lids yeah. we sell the little plastic. Yeah, those ones. are neat. Yeah. Um, that works nice to uh, get. And you then I had to show off my big <coughs> onion. I mean, we had some we got some customers out there that really know how to grow onions. Yeah. And I'm always envious when I see those good pictures there, but I had to show off my big onion. As far as consistently sized big onions, I think the best picture I saw was that of, I can't remember his name. They ain't too far around here, but he grew them in a high tunnel. Yeah, he, I know him well, not his name, but they own a chicken farm. They own a, chi, a egg laying farm. They know what they do. And man, they did a great job on onions. They they didn't have any, uh, they was all <sighs> big, you know, I, 
I would get a few real big ones, most medium sized ones, and a few small ones, but man, they were real consistent as far as their size went. They yeah. did a great job. I wish I could remember their name, but I yeah, think they did post it on the road by road. They group. did, and I know it just gives us a doom. I'm having one of those scenes. I can moments. see him right now. Yeah. Him and his wife are just really sweet people. They come over here from time to time, and uh, they grow a lot of produce. They do. Good produce, Good too. produce. They're hard-working people, and they know what they're doing. They do know what they're doing. Uh, they show sure enough uh, good market farmers. They know what they're yep. doing. Okay, so uh, like I said, share your favorite memories from our 100 shows, what you like there, and uh, you may have some that we even just forgot about. We got a few questions from last week's show we're going to bump through, and then we got a little giveaway thing we're going to talk about at the end. Yep. Um, so if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hosttools.com, and we'll send you a nice little prize. Yep, first one's from Tyler Brack, and he's asking, interesting topics. What's the best way to trellis tomatoes, cucumbers, sugar snap beets, I think sugar snap peas? Excuse me? I think he meant sugar snap peas. but Okay, sugar snap and then beets. Oh, be oh I got you. The top over there, I see. What about, thought about using a 5 by 8 concrete reinforced, whoo, thought about using a 5 by 8 concrete reinforcing wire mesh panel. Boy, that'd be nasty. Yeah, so let's talk about trellising real quick. Uh, several different ways to trellis stuff. We got the the Florida weed video coming out on Tuesday to show you how I do my tomatoes. We're actually, you had pretty good success Florida weaving indeterminate tomatoes last year with the T-Post, and uh, I'm doing that this year. I also have another row of cherry tomatoes I'm going to use the Horta Nova trellis on. I've seen pictures of it done before, and I'm going to give it a go. So, um, as far as cucumbers go, pole beans, and like I said, I'm, I wouldn't do it on beefsteak tomatoes, but I'm going to try it with these cherry tomatoes. This Horta Nova stuff right here is really easy and re really easy to use and really easy to put up. Now, I use cattle panels for years, and there's nothing wrong with cattle panels. I still got a bunch of them. It takes me a good little bit longer to put up them cattle panels than it does this Horta Nova trellis. Now, I understand there's people out there that don't like to use something and then throw it away. They like to reuse stuff over and over. This stuff here, you could reuse it, but you ain't gonna wanna reuse it. This is a convenience item here. You're gonna put it up. When you're done with it, you're gonna go clip them zip ties. You're gonna roll up all the plant debris and it makes it real easy to clean up your garden. This is the first year that I have used it. I got some po uh, pole beans I'm growing, Mr. Jason at Cog Hill gave me, and um, I'm using it for those. I would normally use cow panels, but I'm using it, and I have to say, it went up in about an eighth of the time of what it took cow panels. Yeah. And I normally have to work by myself out in the garden because everybody scatters when, they, when I'm up there. They don't know they want to come help me. It's me and my dog Tank. Now I can tote, I'm pretty good size boy, I can tote a 16 foot cow panel out there, but that right there is, is a lot easier. It's a lot easier, so it's it's easier to do if you're just one person. And we sell this stuff in different lengths. Now this is the biggest one we've got. This is 328 feet, but we sell it in smaller lengths than that. And it uh, it goes up real easy. I used to zip ties, I use metal fence posts, but I used to zip ties also. Yeah, and the best value, we have several different sizes, but the best value is the 328 foot one. This is what I use, and I just cut a piece. You know, some of my rows are 30 foot long, some of them are 40 foot long. I just cut it off to length, and I think at this length it comes out to about a quarter per foot. Now, it, everybody's different, you know. I understand some people's a little more frugal than others, but at a quarter a foot, it ain't worth trying to save it for me. And, I, and it makes it easy because it pulls up, the, when I yank it up, it pulls up the plants, I roll it up, throw it in the burn pile, and then I can turn over a plot in no time. As opposed to the cattle panels, I've got to pull all that plant debris off of them. Uh, it just takes a little longer. So. Now, I can see if you're doing something permanent or if you're growing a gourd or maybe a pumpkin. I've seen pumpkins growing on trellises before, some of these small pumpkins. I could see that. You yeah, I wasn't some... growing winter squash on there. Winter squash, yeah, I could see you'd need something heavy like uh, a, a wire mesh or a cow panel. I can see that being more advantageous. But I can tell you people, for pole beans, for cucumbers, and all that kind of stuff, that's the cat's meow right there. Yeah, once you use it one time and put it up, you'll say, that was a heck of a lot easier. You'll be done 
and sitting down having a refreshment while the feller putting up the cow panels is sweating and a huffing and a puffing. Yep. All right. Question number two comes from Matthew Williams. He says, thanks for the info on calcium for the tomatoes. While purchasing on your site, I was browsing seeds and he landed in the gourds. Oh. He said, I don't know much about gourds or how to use them. Are you all growing any this year? Now, you've grown gourds before. I've grown gourds a lot. I haven't grown any in the last couple of years. I did think about growing some this year. And I we may got a bunch of gourd variety. We got a added. bunch of gourd variety, and I may grow some. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute what I'm leaning toward. The ones I've grown in the past was loofah sponge, which is a gourd, and we made sponges out of them. But if you've never grown loofahs, they fun to grow. Birdhouse gourds. I grew them a couple of years and made me, I bought me one of those bits and made me some birdhouses out of them. Now, if you're trying to attract martins in your garden or you want to give some birdhouses away or make them, man, those birdhouse gourds is the way to go. A bird will attract and go in those a lot better than they will the plastic ones. They don't get near as hot in the summertime as the plastic ones do, and they like them a lot better. And we got one called Birdhouse Bottle Gourd. It's perfect yep. size for that. And, you know, a lot of these women out there, including your mother, they like to paint. Yep. They like to get them crafty. gourds crafty and to make all kinds of things out of gourds. Gourds are fun to grow. Gourds are easy to grow. Not a lot of pest pressure. They just give them plenty of room and let them grow. They're, they're fun. Now... There's one called a Buell Gourd. Yeah. Now that's the one I, if it That's me, what I'm going to grow if I grow one this year. Make some, so I was thinking you grow something in Buell Gourds and you cut them in half and make some little bowls out of them, put, have your bowl stashed down at the sugar shack. Yep. Uh, but they're pretty, they're round gourd, but if you basically cut them in half, they make a nice little bowl. I've got inspired now. I'm going to go, I'm going <laughs> to go plant me. So I got a spot out there. I was wondering what I was going to put there. I'm, that's what I'm going to plant. I, I, at this point, you'd probably be better off transplanting them. I think I'm transplanting all my winter squash from now on. I, I did oh, I them can, butternuts. I can grow them from seed. Uh, it, I just like the transplanting. I, I'm bad about it. every now and then I'll plant some direct seed stuff too deep. But if I'm transplanting, I, I seem to do a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, to answer your questions, I have not grown in the last three or four years, but I think I am. I think you just got struck. I'm going to plant me some bowl, buell gourds, which we call, we're going to make bowls out of them we got them on the site go check out all the gourds there all right and Rhonda w wants to know great show can you suggest the best way to find a provider of good compost internet search ask local feed and seed store we purchased a truckload of composted horse manure from someone off craigslist and we got a garden full of weeds and morning glory we didn't have many weeds prior to adding that compost. We live in central Georgia. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Well, Rhonda, the, the fact of the matter is the truth of the whole thing is folks that's good at making compost usually ain't real good at using the internet. And so if they got good compost, you can search for on Google till you blue in the face and you're liable not to find it. That good compost we found <coughs> ain't but... 10, 15 minutes down the road from us, but we had no clue about it until one of our customers come in and told us about it. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, I say the best way that I've ever found out about stuff is just word of mouth. Now, that stuff we've been getting is good stuff. We've been paying $18 a ton. I've heard of other customers around here that are going the other direction, and they're paying $40 a cubic yard for compost, which... I, I'd go broke. I, my garden's too big. I couldn't afford $40 a cubic yard. Um, so word of mouth, you just got to talk to people. You know, I would post something on the Row by Row group on Facebook. You might find someone in your area. Uh, talk to other gardeners, see what they're using, and, and, and you might look up and find a good source. Sometimes people got a good source on stuff. They kind of want to keep it a secret, stay quiet about it. Uh, we were fortunate that uh, O'Brien uh, let us in on that secret over there, and we've been using a lot of it. Now, there is a worm farm around middle Georgia somewhere that would be a great source of some some ad additive to your garden. It's not the same thing as compost, but they sell bulk worm castings. I don't know exactly where it's at, but it's around middle Georgia somewhere. But if you can find something like that, if you can find a dairy farm, I mean, a dairy farm, you can, a lot of times they have those barns and you can get the uh, the manure out of that. So they not necessarily compost. If you can't find compost, go to the next best thing, which could be worm castings or a dairy farm and get that cow manure. With dairy farms, most of the time they feed those cows 
a, a particular feed so you don't have to worry about the weed seed passing through them and they collect it in the barn and all that so it's a lot more stable product than horse manure could be however whether it be compost or whether it be manure not necessarily worm castings what you really got to be careful of is making sure that it's not contaminated with a couple of the different herbicides out there that can cause you problems so you want to ask some questions i think we've talked about this before and i don't want to beat a dead horse but there's a couple of them out there uh pickle around that they spray on pastures and another one's called corpure lid they spray on lawns both of those are herbicides believe it or not they can live through that whole cycle in that compost and cause problems in your garden so make sure that you get that compost or manure from a trusted source that can answer those questions about what has been applied yeah and i don't know if they're still in business but they and this may be too far from me if you're in uh, central georgia but they used to be a guy up in gainesville georgia and he had a company called foothills compost and he used a lot of uh, food scraps and stuff like that and he made some fine fine stuff now that may be too far for you to go and get some but you may want to check that out i don't even know if he's still doing it but he was making some pretty good stuff at one point in time yep all right last question is from usn038 and we've been getting this a lot how do i know when to harvest my garlic i dug one up looks like a large leek or onion before it bulbs but i don't see any segments tops are getting some sprouts at the top older looking leaves start to look a little rough um when you need to get that garlic up well george james posted that last night on same question last night on our rope row group george is a good farmer and I told him my experience, now I'm not no garden, garlic, excuse me, garlic expert, but I have grown elephant garlic for a few years now. When about, you can pretty much time it, a week to two weeks after your onions get ready. And that leaf on that garlic starts yelling up, turning a little bit brown, and just seems like it's lost its figure. It's time to dig them up. So that's kind of much what I go by. Now, regular garlic, you're going to have to ask somebody, because I ain't never grown enough of it, much less a sandwich, much less tell you how to harvest it. But with elephant leeks, telltale sign is watch that top. When it starts going backwards, it's probably time to get them out of the dirt. Yeah, and now I have seen that before with the elephant garlic where it doesn't stratify uh, in the bulbs. I, the farm I was helping out last year, we were a little late on planting our elephant garlic and it, it never got cold enough to stratify. So if you didn't, if your timing wasn't just right with your planting, you can't. Now you still eat it, it'll still be good. It's just not going to break up into individual cloves. I or it's not going to make the big big cloves. Right. I Some years it's happen. just better garlic, elephant garlic years than other years. That's right. Uh, but And then sometimes, I think I saw at least one person put a picture on the row by row group. Theirs was nice and stratified into cloves there. All right, so good questions there. Don't forget to send us your address if we answer your question on the show. Now, let's get to the last part here. So, um, originally we had planned, just like, I think we did it on our 50th show, to do like a big giveaway, draw some names and stuff, but, but we just ain't hardly got nothing to give away. We can't keep, <laughs> we can't keep nothing in stock. We've been sold out. Sold out. Every time we put something on the site, uh it, it's gone in the next few days yeah and look here you know, a lot of y'all are emailing us questions asking we're gonna get something back in stock and i be honest with you i ain't been answering any of them because i ain't got a better idea than what you got we don't show no we got some stuff we can build when we have time we get it built we put it on there in a couple hours it's gone but as far as getting some of these materials back in that we're out of your guess is as good as mine yeah we just got decent another supply of drip irrigation stuff in drip kits look okay for right now but uh, I quit answering those questions because I simply do not know. I mean, I have a vendor tell me, you know, you're going to get it so-and-so. And a month later, I got it. And I done, done told them people they're going to get it. We're going to get it next week. And I done told a story. So I quit telling stories because I just simply don't know. When the truck backs up and unloads it, I know we got it. That's right. That's right. This, so this is what we're going to do as far as the giveaway here. Okay. We're going to have, we're going to, there's going to be three winners on this. Three. Three winners. Okay. I've got five questions here. Three and five. I've got five questions. Now, we, I wanted, when I was thinking up this, I wanted to find a way to kind of reward our most loyal viewers, the people who watch us the most, people who have been with us from the get-go. So I've got five questions here, and I can tell on the comments, the timeline there, who, who comments first and whatever. So the first three people, whether it be on Facebook or YouTube, to answer these five questions correctly i'm going to send them a nice little box of goodies some hats some micro boost just just some you know 
good stuff. I promise you it'll be well worth your time digging up some of these questions here. So when you answer in the comments there, just do a little bulleted list, one, two, three, four, five, and, uh, and answer all these questions here. So let's go through them. So question number one, and we've talked about this before. You can either find this information on old shows. You might dig around a little bit, but it's all out there. So question number one, most people know we are father and son. How many years and how many days are we apart? Yeah. So basically, how many years plus days older are you than me? Okay, that's question number one. Number two, in what year was Hoss Tools started? Now, there could be a, a little bit of confusion here, I, I, so I'm going to give a little hint to clear it up. It's an even number. Okay, what year was Hoss Tools started? Number three. And you're going to have to dig around in some episodes to find this one. There's an heirloom winter squash that we're growing a seed crop of this year. It's one that we have never grown before. What is the name of that? Now, you may, the spelling on that, do as best as you can. But And the, yeah, it's kind of hard to pronounce. Uh, That's another hint, ain't it? Yeah. You about yeah. said it, didn't you? Yeah. Anyway, so what is the name of that heirloom squash we're growing a seed crop of this year? We, sh we talked about it on one of the previous shows. Number four, what is the title of our most viewed row by row episode on YouTube? Not, we're not talking about the Facebook views, but on YouTube, what is the title of our most viewed show? So it shows the views underneath that video. You can, you can find it. Yep. You can dig around and find it. We're gonna, we gotta make them work for this. This is gonna no, be no. an awesome this is, box of goodies. It is. You gotta work for it. Okay, and the, the last one, number five, Greg loves pickled okra. He eats it about every three or four shows. What is the name of the book we used to carry? It. What is the name of the book that has his favorite pickled okra, okra recipes in it? When I was getting these potatoes out of the oven earlier, I looked up there and there that book was on the countertop. There so, it was. There it was staring at me. We've talked about that book many times before. So all, all five of these questions, easy to find. The first three people to answer all five questions correctly, we're gonna send you a nice little uh, prize. And I'll let you know if you answer them all correctly, I'll send you a message and, and uh, get you information. So that's how we're gonna do the giveaway. That's how we're gonna reward uh, some of our more loyal and uh, people that have been watching us for a long time. And it's been a fun ride and we look forward to oh, a, absolutely. 100 more episodes. Uh, if you enjoyed this show here, Check out these other two videos right here. I think you'll really like those as well. And we'll see you guys next Take time. Take care.